Good morning. All right, really quick, let's get started, everybody. So there's been a change to the midterm. I went ahead, I went ahead and scheduled the midterm for the week before Thanksgiving. This will ensure that everyone has a chance to do their holiday travels and we can get everything graded in a timely manner. I want everybody to pull out a sheet of paper, actually multiple sheets of paper. I will post these lecture slides, but not until after the lecture because I want everybody to be engaged and drawing out these figures that we're gonna be doing. This is a very, very geometrical uh, lesson. It's gonna require a lot of spatial thinking and if you're following along with a with a um, something on your iPad, it's just not going to work. It's going to be better if you're drawing this out. Obviously, a tablet. If you're drawing it out on a tablet, that's great too. So we talked about the forces on a charged particle or a collection of charged particles due to a magnetic field. But we didn't worry about how the field got there to begin with. What we're going to do today is we're going to actually find how we get that magnetic field. So here we have a picture of CERN, the LHC. The LHC uses magnetic fields in a bunch of different ways. They use magnetic fields to control the location of the proton to prevent the proton from colliding with the walls as it goes around in the cyclotron. And they also use magnetic fields to inject energy into the system by pulsing it. And they, they're able to accelerate the protons using magnetic fields. So magnetic fields are very important. They have a ton of applications. Okay, question. Yes. Okay, better? Okay, thanks for reminding me about that. Okay, so now we're going to look at where the magnetic field comes from. So here we have our first image of a charged particle, a positive charged particle moving with some velocity in this direction. And you can see there's a hand there pointing along the velocity path. And then there's a little r hat vector in the center there. And that's very important as well. And there's also a field point P. And then there's a magnetic field encircling this charge. The, the simplest concept I want you to get from this picture so far to start with is when we have a positive charge going this way, if I take my right hand and I point it in the direction of the velocity that the charge is moving in, there will be a magnetic field due to that, and the direction of the magnetic field is going to be the curl of my fingers. So as you can see there, the magnetic field B is curling around this charge as it goes. So stated clearly, the right hand rule for the magnetic field due to a positive charge moving at constant velocity. You take the thumb of your right hand in the direction of the velocity, and then your fingers now curl around the charge in the direction of the magnetic field lines. And if the charge is negative, the field lines move in the opposite direction. And then we have these field points, R and V. They both lie in that beige plane. And then B is perpendicular to this plane. Then for these field points, which I'll talk about more in a second, these field points R and V both lie in the gold plane, and then B is perpendicular to this plane as well. So you can see there's two separate planes in this figure. And then we have a perspective view on top where the X symbol indicates the charge is moving into the plane of the page. And you can do that right now. You can take your hand, 
point it into the page and you'll see that your fingers give you the correct direction for the magnetic field. And then we get this equation for the quantity uh, the magnetic field uh, magnitude of the magnetic field so no longer the vector form of it and it's given by this expression but I'm going to show you exactly how we arrive at that just one more view of this perspective view and then the magnetic field vectors due to a moving positive charge at each point B it's perpendicular to that plane like I said earlier of R and V and its magnitude is proportional to the sine of the angle between them so let's draw that out specifically so we can see what we're talking about here stated the way that the book has it it's written like that that's a symbolic way to represent it but there's other ways to write this out that I think are a little bit better okay so now I'm gonna do it uh, my way the style that I've like to to do it because I think it's more common sense okay so we have our positive charge Q it's moving at some velocity V can everybody see that clearly great then we have our field point R hat technically you could write this sorry I don't have a ruler let me try to make that a little bit a little bit more straight if we could call this a field point P like they do in the book but you'll also see it just written as R hat what R hat is is it's a position vector it points from the point of wherever the charge is to wherever we're worried about the magnetic field you see this is a much more complicated situation than just one equation this actually represents an infinite number of equations for every single situation you could possibly imagine because I don't just have one field point here I have an infinite number of field points in this entire figure and the magnetic field is going to depend upon what that field point is for example if I choose a point along here as my field point P I'm going to get a zero magnetic field and I'll show you why so first of all we have our R which is our vector our R hat but then if we want to actually put this in a form that we can use to calculate an actual magnitude we have to figure out how to work with this expression so we have in the the most formal terms the magnetic vector magnetic field is this constant called the permeability of free space it's the ability of a space to support a magnetic field it's different for different substances in unless otherwise specified since we're not doing magnetic materials we'll always assume it's the permeability of free space but just know that different surfaces and different environments will have a different permeability associated with them but mu naught is that which is true for free space the ability of free space essentially what we would think of as a vacuum to support a magnetic field and then we have this constant 4 pi on the bottom that's the constant part then we have Q our charge V our vector cross r hat and then I put a magnitude r cubed on bottom which one of those will cancel out as you'll see in a second so now what we want to do is we want to put this in a form where we have a magnitude so we want to actually write now b magnitude so I'm going from a vector to a magnitude mu naught over 4 pi so far so good this is just a scalar we don't have to do anything to it now we have a cross product what do we do with a cross product what's the way to write it there's a way that we can write it 
what we want is we want the r vector portion of r here this r vector this is r magnitude we want the portion of the r vector that's perpendicular to this velocity component let me put a theta here too we need that okay so that's this vector so we have r sine theta so we're going to have q v r sine of theta and then we have that over r cubed but then one of these r's cancels out so then we have mu naught over 4 pi q v sine theta over r squared and that gives us our magnitude of our B field. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. This, this is the actual vector B. And this is the magnitude v the velocity so we when we take this when we take this angle between v and r then we just then we don't have to worry about the direction of v anymore we take the we take the portion of r that's perpendicular to v and that's that then we don't have to do any no further no further analysis required for the vector but you can keep the little arrow over it if you want just to know that it still is the velocity yes question I'm sorry I didn't hear you um you could think of it as the magnitude essentially but it's it is it's we can do that too that's fine because once you take the once you look once you take this this cross product you're looking at the component perpendicular to it but the book has it written with the arrow still over it so you can use either convention actually the book doesn't have it written with the arrow over it sorry so okay great so yes just to clarify then but you can't but I have seen it written where they keep the arrow over it so the point is when the notation you have to just know what exactly you're doing because you'll see the the notation will vary from place to place but yes once you take that that cross product and you find the component perpendicular that's that's all the geometrical information that you need then at that point now we're at now we're just down to a magnitude for that so the quantity mu naught is called it's called the magnetic constant and um, it's also called the permeability of free space and a point charge in motion also produces an electric field with field lines that radiate outward from positive charge the magnetic field lines are completely different. For a point charge moving with velocity v, the magnetic field lines are circles centered on the line of v and lying in planes perpendicular to this line. The field line directions for a positive charge are given by the right hand rule. And what you do is you grasp the velocity vector with your right hand so that your right thumb points in the direction of v. And then your fingers curl around the line of V in the same sense as the magnetic field lines assuming that Q is positive if it's negative which direction does it go in then opposite correct okay so we have this figure that we've seen a couple times already I want you to draw that out and visualize it as we go forward and do these examples so this figure shows parts of a few of these field lines but just know that there's an infinite number of them because we're actually dealing with a vector field and then some of the field lines are in a plane through Q 
perpendicular to V. And then what about these, what's B for field points, R hats, position vectors that go through here? What's my B going to be? What's it going to be equal to? Anybody? And why is that? Why is it going to be equal to 0? Yes, exactly. Because we were looking at the component perpendicular, not the component that's parallel in this direction. So the B field going through this point is 0. And you can see that in this drawing as well. OK. So these equations describe the B field of a point charge moving with constant velocity. If the charge accelerates, the field can be much more complicated. And we won't need these more complicated results. What actually happens if it accelerates is it emits radiation. And that process is very complicated. It actually requires, in some cases, quantum field theory. And in other cases, we can treat it classically. In this, in this class, it, especially at this moment, we won't worry about it at all. Eventually, we will talk about the beautiful unification between electric and magnetic fields that are encapsulated in Maxwell's equations. But we're not there yet. First, we need to get all of the basics down. So we're just going to note that we're talking about charges moving at constant velocities when we look at these situations. So the moving charge particles that make up a current in a wire accelerate at points where the wire bends and the direction V changes. Because the magnitude VD of the drift velocity in, in a conductor is typically very small, the centripetal acceleration, VD squared over R, remember that from your classical mechanics, centripetal acceleration, V squared over R, that is so small that we can ignore its effects. So what they're saying here is, Actually, there's acceleration even in a normal wire when it curves around because a change in direction is also an acceleration. But the component of that velocity is small enough that we can just ignore it and not worry about it when we're doing our analysis. So that's why you'll see later on we're doing it for a straight current carrying conductor, a straight section of it. So that's a question that, I'm, a, a subtle point that some of you might be wondering about if you're thinking about this. It's a good way to illustrate why the limits of our analysis for the situation. But this is how we do it. We always take the simplest case and we break everything down into pieces. And then we can treat the more complicated situations later. So in SI units, the numerical value of mu naught has been measured to nine significant figures, which is a huge scientific accomplishment in its own right. And it's this value, and it can be expressed in different units. Uh, the common form to see it in is tesla meters per ampere, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. But you will see it in other uh, forms from time to time. Um, and then there's another amazing aspect of this magnetic constant. Um, recall that we have an electric constant called the, the permittivity of free space. That's the ability of free space to support an electric field, not a magnetic field, an electric field. That's epsilon naught. Uh, and that appears in Coulomb's law and Gauss's law. And it has this value of 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per new Newton times meter squared. We can multiply epsilon zero by mu zero. So we can multiply the two values together. And then we can take the square root of the product and then the reciprocal of the result, and we get the speed of light. So what that tells you is that there's a link between these electric and magnetic fields and the ability of free space to support them. When you combine that, you have an electric and magnetic field moving through space at the speed of light, which would lead scientists to speculate maybe an, a changing electric and magnetic field in the right way is light, which is what we'll come to later. All right, now we're going to do an example. We're going to take everything that we just talked about, all the geometry, and we're going to apply it to an actual hands-on example. So read through this problem and draw a picture of it. Start by, by drawing everything out, every piece of it out. Visualize it in your mind. Engage with 
these equations. Think about this situation. Do the best job you can and write it all out. And I'll give you a minute to do that. So we've got two protons. They move parallel to the x-axis in opposite directions. So I'm going to write, I'm going to draw this out too. So two protons move parallel to the x-axis, opposite directions, at the same speed v. When they say speed, they're not talking about the uh, velocity. They're talking about the magnitude. Speed is a magnitude, not an actual vector. Um, and the speed is small compared to the speed of light. At the instant shown, find the electric and magnetic forces on the upper proton and compare their magnitudes. Okay, so right there, we already have a problem. I drew this by reading the way that I read the problem. I drew it a little differently than the situation is actually illustrated. So that's an important part of these problems. Whenever I get an electrodynamics or magnetic problem and it doesn't have a drawing made for me, that's always a problem. And that's often the case, especially in the worst, hardest graduate level electrodynamics problems. So an important point here that I need to keep in mind when I'm writing these exam questions is I'd better be very specific, more specific than this question is, and give you a very clear drawing so that I'm communicating exactly what I'm talking about. It's not as easy to communicate as you would think. So let's redraw that. So we have positive charge above and below. There's a lot, there's an R vector, a position vector connecting the top, pointing from the top, from the bottom to the top. And then we have some, uh, some fields. So first let's look at the, we've got a, we've got a, we've got a charge going this way. So there's a B field wrapping around as I do this. And then we've got a charge going this way as well. So there's a B field going this way too. And then at this point here, at some point, since it's going all the way around, at some point it's going gonna, it's gonna to be coming out this way. And so apparently that portion of the B field is going to be important because they took the time to draw it here in this picture. So we haven't, we haven't worked a lot of these problems yet, so we haven't necessarily developed an intuition for why this particular B field. Is that too small or is that okay? Yes. Because it specifies it, good question, because it specifies it in the problem. In the problem, they say, uh, at the instant shown, find the electric and magnetic forces on the upper proton. So we're going to have to be looking at where the, where the source is coming from. Um, but you could probably get the same answer. In fact, you certainly could if you did it in the opposite sense. You don't have to do it. You don't have to pick this particular charge and do it this way. You can do it the other way in reverse, just you adjust your quantities correspondingly. Great question. Okay. So we're going to start with our picture. We've got a B field that we know is important. We've got a couple of velocities. One of them's minus, one of them's positive. Now we have to go through and 
figure out how to use this this expression to actually solve this problem okay so but we have another complication because we talked about the electric field too so first we have to find the electric force on the upper proton and that's a pretty straightforward calculation so since they want to know the electric force on the upper proton we have this constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught not the same thing as mu naught epsilon is permittivity of free space and then we have q over r squared dotted with q so this is the <coughs> this is one of the charges multiplied by the other charge so we have q dot q q squared and that's that's from Coulomb's law the force is the 1 over 4 pi q over r squared dotted with the other charge q and then the forces are repulsive and the force on the upper proton is vertically upward in the positive y direction so why is that the case why are the forces repulsive easy they're the same sign and it's going to be since it's repulsive and they're the electric field line that we're talking about is this one here so if there's an e field here an electric field line and it's pushing upwards on this one so the let's see what's another good color here's another good color so the electric force I'll do my forces in this color the electric force is upward in the positive y direction so we've done the first part of our problem and we could all we have to do to get that magnitude is know the separation r so now we're talking about we're not talking about a position vector we're just talking about a magnitude literally the the distance that the two are separated so it's magnitude r squared okay next we have to do our magnetic equation the velocity of the upper proton is v in the i hat direction we can see that if we look at our drawing again but it looks like it's in the negative i hat direction doesn't it so why are they saying that it's in the i hat direction Oh, no, it says lower. Okay, good. Yes. The velocity of the lower proton is in the i hat direction. I was thinking, for some reason I read that as upper. Okay, good. So the velocity of the lower proton is in the i hat direction. So we can find, we can use the right hand rule for the cross product V cross R that we talked about a few minutes ago. And the B field due to the lower proton at the position of the upper proton is in the positive Z direction and we can get it from the equation there so what we do is we just rewrite our equation and we think about it component by component so I've got QV I've got V first I'll write it in the vector form because it's nice to do that I've got our constants mu naught over 4 pi then I've got Q V now it's in a vector I hat so we're talking about the position vector r qv qvr qv or sorry qv so v this is the which which what vector is this i hat associated with right now which vector in our problem somebody say it huh which which vector is this i hat coming from v v it's V so V this is still a vector so now I can get rid of that and just write QV I hat because I took my vector so when you're doing this problem like this I don't actually have it let's let me rewrite this so B magnitude right we're gonna we're gonna start with our equation here and then we're gonna have Q V cross R R hat over r cubed 
when I take this and I actually find the component of V I'm interested in, that goes away and it just becomes QV, I hat. So I made it a vector, cross, and then I have J hat, okay? J hat. Why is it J hat? Because it's going to be the point pointing in the direction to my target. So I said, let me go back and read the question one more time so we know exactly what we're doing. We want to find the magnetic force on the upper proton. So what we have here then is to get, to get this, since we're finding the magnetic force on the upper proton, we have to find, we have to draw a vector from our source of the magnetic field to the target. The target is here. So R, I didn't draw all of R. R goes all the way from here to here. So that's our R, and we can also express that as J hat. We didn't give a length. They were just vague about that. They just said it's in, the direc it's in that direction. It actually has a length to it, but we don't know that length, so it's enough to symbolically represent that as such. So there's another important rule from these problems. You won't always know the magnitude of the vectors that you're doing, but you have to represent their direction symbolically to do, these, to do these calculations. So that's another further abstraction to note when you're doing these problems. Keep that in mind. Does what I just said make sense to everybody? Yes. It does matter in actuality, but we don't know it and we don't have any way to instantaneously calculate it. We can't really break this up into its components like using the Pythagorean theorem right off the bat. In some cases we can, right? When we had that QVR sine theta in that last drawing, I could break up and find the magnitude of R in the direction of V. But in, in this case, we can't really worry about that right now. We just have to s symbolically represent it. Okay, now they do this thing where they put it as R squared. You can do that, but just know that it's actually R cubed and one of the R's cancels out, the, don't ever confuse yourself and think that one of those R squares cancels out because they don't. Does that make sense? The way I wrote it here, this, this will turn into an R magnitude on top, and then one of these R magnitudes will go away and stay in R squared. In the book, they don't bother to show that. It's just implicitly assumed that you won't cancel out one of these R's when you take this cross product. They both stay. Okay, that's a confusing point. I always want to specify that there. Okay, great. So now we have our now we have our expression. What do we what do we do next? Next, we actually take the cross product. So we know from doing the cross product that and you can review the cross product and prove this to yourself later. But we know that i cross j is just going to be k hat. So we have I cross J is going to be K hat. And then what do we still have left over? QV over R squared, where R is the magnitude, the separation. And that's when we'll be concerned with the distance, the actual magnitude of that vector. Okay. And then the velocity... So this is, let's just go back a little bit. So this is lower, the case for the lower, okay? So due to lower, due to lower. Now we have the force. So the velocity of the upper proton is minus V. So now that we found the field, now we have to go back to what we did in the last chapter. Okay, this is a big important moment. We're bridging what we learned last week with what we're doing right now. So now we're going to find the magnetic force. So you can see that there's several steps to this. For the electric force, look at how easy it is. We just have this equation. If we know their separation and their charges, we know everything we need to know. For B, first we have to find what the magnetic field is going to be because it's not always going to be this simple Coulomb law form. It could be very complicated. 
So we have to do we have to use this rule just to get started with finding our form and then we have to take what we found and take the cross product again because remember what's the force the magnetic force due to something it's like QVB right sine theta okay so we can we can or QV cross B just keep it in the vector form QV cross B we're still gonna have a V vector here so that's what we're doing next so we have B and now we and we have to know Q and V for the to find the force of the upper proton V is minus I hat so we have Q minus V I hat so the force on the upper is magnitude is Q minus V I hat because it's actually minus I hat so we put that minus sign there cross what we just found there mu naught okay over 4 pi and then Q V K hat over magnitude of R squared. And then when we take that cross product, we get what? We get mu naught over 4 pi. And then the Q's multiply. So we have Q squared, V squared, because we have two velocities there as well over r squared and then we have i cross k is j hat minus i cross k j hat so then here's our answer for the magnetic force so let's let's draw that in there so we've got on our electric force and we've got our magnetic force and look at this it's actually going in the same direction but the magnitudes are not the same it turns out that the electric force is much larger than the magnetic force and that's true for particles moving at slow velocities there's actually a relationship between the magnitudes of electric and magnetic fields based off of their relative velocities of the particles. Okay. So now we have our forces. Magnetic and electric, both in the J hat direction. Using Coulomb's law and our law for finding the magnetic field. Yes. So the direction from the electric force comes from Coulomb's law and it's remember that there's a, a, a whole this charge has a whole bunch of positive charges pointing radially outward we're concerned with the vector that points from this charge to this charge and then we say that it's a straight line they're right above each other so it's going to be this straight line vector here and it's going to be uh, repulsive so it's going to be pointing up if it was attractive because one of these was if this one was negative it'd be downwards because it would be attractive but it's repulsive because of that so that's why it's upwards it comes from the electrostatics of the previous quarter okay all right cool okay so the magnetic interaction is also repulsive as the electric is and then we can find a ratio of their two magnitudes so we basically just take the ratio of these two I won't bother to write it out because for, st for sake of time but you can see that it turns into this interesting result here we, it depends on the permittivity and permeability and velocity squared so that's the ratio so the electric force the magnetic force is going to be 
that ratio is going to increase with increasing velocity. So as this goes faster and moves faster, the magnetic force is going to have a bigger share of that force ratio. At slow velocities, it's going to be much smaller than the electric force. And then with the relationship here that we talked about before with it being 1 over c squared, the permittivity and permeability, this turns into this. So when V is small in comparison to the speed of light, the magnetic force is much smaller than the electric force. Okay. And it's interesting to note that we describe the velocities, fields, and forces as they're measured by an observer who is stationary in the coordinate system. Uh, I don't want to overcomplicate this, so don't think about it too much, but just note that what our observation point and the point, the point that we consider ourselves at rest matters to this problem. If we started assuming that we weren't at rest and thinking really crazy outside the box, then we might come up with a paradox that would lead us to special relativity and then we would be Einstein. But, you know, yeah. Okay, now I want to talk about the principle of superposition of magnetic fields. So the total magnetic field caused by several moving charges is the vector sum of the fields caused by the individual charges. We can use this principle with the results previously to find the magnetic field produced by a current in a conductor. So now we're going to do currents in a conductor. So we begin by calculating the magnetic field caused by a short segment DL, a little infinitesimal bit of length of a current carrying conductor as shown in the figure I'm about to show. The volume segment, let me just go to there. There we go. Okay. Uh, oops. Let me go back a little bit. So the volume segment is ADL, where A is the cross-sectional area. So let me, let me write some of this out here. Get out a piece of paper, or on your piece of paper that you already have, draw this out with me so you can visualize this. Okay, so we have, we have this picture here. We're going to have a little bit of DL, infinitesimal bit of current length, along this wire. So DL, we'll just assume it's infinitely small. Then we have some field point P here. This is where we're worried about what the magnetic field is at any given calculation. And then we have our r hat vector, okay? And then we've got our magnetic, by the right hand rule, since this is a positive charge we're assuming, the field at this point is going to be going out like this, dB, which you can see by using your right hand and the way your fingers curve around this direction, which they also have illustrated there with the hand. And then later on, as we go down this way, the vector field is pointing in this direction, downward, dB. So there's two different planes. At this plane here, this top one, it's pointing, curving around, and then later, it's pointing downwards. So. Hmm. You can see that there. Okay. And then, um, so you're going to use the right-hand rule, and you'll notice for these field points, R and DL both lie in the beige plane, and DB is perpendicular to this plane. So it's just like what we did before. It's very similar. Same kind of idea. And we have some angle here between the velocity, And their velocity is the current. It's encapsulated in this current description. And then we have an angle between r hat and here. We can call it phi. And that's going to be important too. And then here's the top view. So again, it's into the page. Just like a moving charge, we're just a collection of moving charges. And you can see the direction of the magnetic field. So then we can come up with an expression for this infinitesimal bit of current element. Basically, we're taking a differential of Q 
and saying if we integrated we'd have the to if we integrated this expression we'd have the total q so dq q is going to be the integral from 0 to length l they don't have the integral written explicitly there but just know whenever you have a differential you can always do an integral and we have n q and then dl so our integral is going to be over our differential length so this is the charge the location where all the charge is it's presumably these limits would be the same could be the same but they might not be if there's a if there's a length where there's not charge along all of it but typically it would be the same and then we can say that the moving charges in this segment are equivalent to a single charge dq an infinitesimal bit traveling with a velocity equal to the drift velocity just the velocity of the current the average velocity and then the magnetic fields due to the random motions of the charges will on average cancel so technically these charges aren't going to be going all nice and perfectly straight along this wire but we're not going to worry about that we're not going to worry about the statistics of that basically it all averages out to be zero and then we have our expression from before and we have the same result now for this current carrying conductor so we just have differential magnitude it's going to be mu naught over 4 pi uh, dq just takes the role of q here okay and then v drift is just the dr velocity of the charge current sine phi okay same thing as sine theta and then all that over r squared so it's the same equation and then n q magnitude v a equals the current in the element so we have a further simplification we can just express that that more complicated expression in terms of the current so when you have a current if I tell you I you have a much simpler expression for the magnetic field you don't have to count up all of the um, individual charges and do each one individually and drive yourself crazy we've already done that with calculus we we summed everything up in a much simpler way now we know that the differential bit of magnetic field due to the magnitude of that due to the current is mu naught over 4 pi and then we've got I DL sine of phi over R squared same idea and then if you want this to turn into B all you do is integrate DL you find it you count it all up along the length of the conductor and you're good okay and then this is just another way of stating this in vector form so we've got the current we've got the vector length of the element that we're worried about how much length of current conductor we have and the unit vector just like before um, you could also write that as r cubed implicitly knowing that r that's going to turn into r sine phi and one of those r magnitudes in the cube is going to cancel out and we'll be left with r squared or just keep it that way and don't do anything to the bottom when you take when you take that cross product just leave the r's there okay this is called the Biot-Savart law it's a very famous law we use this a lot in physics a lot of it in upper level physics if you take physics classes if you're a physics major you'll see this again when you take a class probably using Griffith CNM or something like that and we can use this law to find the total magnetic field at any point in space due to the current in a complete circuit so to do this we just integrate over all the elements and symbolically it's represented like this and here I have a picture of one of the most impressive beasts in nature that produces currents this this beautiful Jupiter that has some of the strongest most devastating magnetic fields known in our solar system this thing is a monster it produces a massive magnetic field many 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 times greater than Earth's magnetic field in fact it's dangerous to be around this thing there's a there's a moon that orbits it called Io and Io has been absolutely devastated by these magnetic fields they've caused these massive tidal 
uh, forces crushing the, the moon and causing this massive volcanic activity. And why is this thing so magnetic? It's because it's rotating super fast. It's huge, right? It's, it's, it's I don't forget how many hundreds of times bigger than Earth. It's massive. But it rotates like every 10 hours. It spins faster than Earth. So it's got this rapid movement and then this, this composition, this hydrogen, this liquid hydrogen and helium that it's made up out of is an excellent conductor. So you have these massive charges just going around in this, in this planet. And these produces huge currents and thus huge magnetic fields. So when you see Jupiter, next time you see it, just think of it as a, mad, a, ma a huge magnet, produ producing magnet. It produces mag gigantic magnetic fields from this Biot-Savar law given by that. Okay, let's do another example. Um, we're going to do a 10-minute break, but first, before we do that 10-minute break, let's read over this question. Let's try to draw out a picture so you can think about it during the break. Okay, I'll give everybody a chance. Read this over and then write it out and do a drawing of it. So we have a copper wire, good conductor. It carries a steady current, I, of 125 amperes to an electroplating tank. Um, let me see if I can show you a figure of that. It'll help to have the figure. So there's the figure of that electroplating tank. So go ahead and draw that figure out too. Since they gave us the figure, we won't bother to read through it and try to construct it completely from words. We'll also draw it out. And as you're drawing this, you'll notice that we have two different field points. So this is going to be one of our problems. We're going we're to illustrate that actually our equation is valid not just for one point, but it's valid for an infinite number of points. Here we've just chosen two of them to find the magnetic field strength. But we could choose anywhere on this picture or in our minds anywhere, and we would have some kind of field associated with it. Now, obviously, the magnetic field from Jupiter still exists here on Earth because there's no rule that I have mathematically where I say, oh, after a certain distance, this thing just goes to zero. It's still here, but you'll notice that it has, it typically has an, a 1 over r squared dependence, just like our electric force and just like our gravitational force. So what essentially happens is the the magnitude of the magnetic field falls off very quickly as 1 over r squared. So in practice, just like with gravitational forces, we don't really talk too much about the gravitational force on us due to Jupiter. We don't talk very much about the magnetic force on us due to Jupiter either. Unless we're talking about Jupiter's magnetic force doing something to a comet that impacts us, which can happen on occasion. Or an asteroid. Okay, so just going back to this question one more time uh, before we take the quick break. So we've got this copper wire uh, carrying a steady 125 ampere current to an electroplating tank. We want to find the magnetic field due to a one centimeter segment, so we have our DL there, uh, of this wire at a point 1.2 meters away from it 
And if the point is A at point 1, which we showed in the drawing there, which is straight out to the side of the segment, and B, point 2, which is in the XY plane on a line at 30 degrees to the segment. Okay, uh, we'll do a 10-minute break really quick. You can work on that problem, think about the solution, and then we'll solve it when we get back. Darn it. Hello, hello. All right, we're back. Let's get started. So we have our problem. Now let's talk about how we're going to solve this. So we've got our current going this way. We'll draw this, draw a little sketch of this on the board here really fast. Current I going this way. Okay. And then we've got two magnetic field points, one back here that we're interested in, and then we've got one directly above this little segment, one centimeter segment. One point here as well. We'll call these points P1 and P2. Okay. So what are the magnetic fields at that point? So we know that we had this expression for and you know what I'm actually gonna write these out explicitly so let's write this this is our equation we're gonna use DB is equal to mu naught over 4 pi okay I DL cross our R vector that's going to be different for the two different field points. And then magnitude r squared. OK, great. So now we have what we need to solve this. So we have to sort of go through and figure out. Let's take it case by case. We can use this. We can know that this current element uh, that's shown in the figure it points in a direction. Let's see. Let me put that on here, too. Okay. It points in this. It's indicated here. And it points in a specific direction. See if you can see that there. Uh, it's in the minus x direction. So the current element is going this way in the minus x. So we have a minus i hat associated with that dl length there. So in both cases, this dl is going to have a minus i hat. So we can, we can start to write this out applied to our specific problem right below it u naught over 4 pi. And then we're going to have a minus i hat corresponding to the dl. We're going to have an i, which is the current. And then the unit vector r for each field point is directed from the current element toward that r point. For p1 here, it's in the positive y direction, so j hat. So we're going to have minus i cross j hat over r squared. Okay. And then what's that going to turn into? So we're going to have minus i cross j hat. And that's going to give us a k hat. But we have a negative k hat. So we're going to have a minus sign, an overall minus sign, coming out in front of this expression. Sorry, I have to erase this drawing a little bit so I have space here. So we have minus i hat cross j hat gives us a minus k hat. So minus mu naught over 4 pi i k hat over r squared. And we still have this DL associated with it as well. I'll just put this little differential 
dl. It's no longer a vector. It was a vector originally, but now we have the, we took the direction into account for the cross product, so now it's just a length. It's just the length of that. So it becomes the length, which is one centimeter. So now we can just plug in this value here. So we're gonna actually get a number here. So we're gonna get a, the mu naught over four pi gives us 10 to the minus seven Teslas. Teslas times meters per ampere. We still have a minus sign overall in front of this. And now we just have our current. That's in amperes. That's pretty easy. We just plug in the 125 amperes here. So this is a nice equation if we, if we know our current. And then our length is just 10 to the minus 2, right? Yeah. 10 to the minus 2 meters. And then what's our distance here? They said it was 1.2 meters away. So we know that it's 1.2 squared meters away. We'll put the unit in there. And then let's not forget our k hat. We got to do that. Okay, so then we get minus 8.7 times 10 to the minus 8 Teslas. And that's in the k hat direction. Okay, and we can also see that with the right hand rule when we do that as well. Okay, up here, going through. Okay, so. The direction of B at point 2 is also in the XY plane. So what about for part B? Okay, this is a little bit more involved. Now we have to do a little bit of geometry. It's not going to be quite so simple. So let's go back to our, our rule, and then let's look, at this, let's look at this drawing here to figure out why this is more complicated. And we're going to take our time on this because this is very important to get this. So we're going to look at point two specifically. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to redraw this, uh, this figure. Sorry. I'm going to go back and I'm going to redraw this figure. So we've got I here. We've got our DL. I's going this way. And we've got this point two, like this, at this angle, P2. OK. And then this is, this is 1.2 meters as well. And then we've got this angle of 30 degrees here. So we've got an angle. We have to take that angle into account now when we're doing this part B here. OK. So we go back to our law. This part's not going to change. Mu naught over 4 pi. OK. But then we've got I DL cross R. We know DL is in the minus I direction. So we've got I DL, and then there's a minus I hat. That's the unit vector for that part of it. And then we've got this cross R. But what's our R? We have to break our R vector up into components. So we've got an R vector pointing this way. So we've got to get we've got to get this component of it and we've got to get this component of it. So now we have to do a little bit of trigonometry which we've done before, it's not too bad. We know it's we know that this x this i hat component is going to be negative and it's going to be the cosine. So it's going to be minus r cosine of 30. It's going to be I hat, right? Okay. And um, we're going to have our sine of 30 for the J hat, and it's positive. There's not a negative there. So plus our sine. And I'll just leave the R off because it would be over R cubed if we didn't do that. We'll keep it the way that it is in the book. But just note that that's implicitly part of it, OK? So that's our, that's our r hat. So we've got cross 
we've got minus cosine 30 i hat. So you could just think of this as minus i hat cross minus i hat plus sine 30 j hat. But if you're a little bit quick, you're going to know something about some of these cross products, right? We're actually going to have the, um, what's the i hat cross the i hat going to give you? Right. So we, know we don't have any, remember, we don't have any magnetic force if it's going in that direction. So one of those is going to cancel out, and we're just going to be left with a single k hat as our result. So the cosine entry, this and this is zero. So this goes away, and then we just have minus i hat cross j hat, and that's going to give us a negative k hat. So we have this, this component does not contribute. This component does. This component does contribute. And then, so to finish this off then, we have mu naught over 4 pi i dl. And then it's going to be sine of 30. k hat. There's a negative associated with that k hat. Does everybody understand how this term does not contribute and why? Okay, great. No questions about that. Good. And then we have r squared, which we know 1.2 squared. And we also know i. 125 and dl. So 125 amperes, 10 to the minus 2, sine 30, k hat, and we're done. And we have like minus 4.3 times 10 to the negative, what was it? 10 to the negative 8 Teslas. And it's in the minus k hat direction. So it's negative. Okay, great. So now we know how to, now we know sometimes we can't just take, we have to always take the component that's perpendicular to the direction of the uh, velocity for the r hat. So when we looked at this image, when we looked at that last figure, we had to take the r hat and find that perpendicular component, or we could just write it out in its components and then take the cross product and know that. Yes? Yes, you can, you can, you can like, you, that basically you just do it in your head, like that term goes away and then the next term multiplies and that term does something else. Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes. This is part B. Oh, for, so it becomes B now because here's why it's B. It's not DB anymore, it's B because why? Because we took this implicitly and we plugged in an actual length for DL. So when we, when we plug in an actual length, we implicitly do that integral then because we integrated from the length 0 to the L. And then so it goes from dB to dB. Yes. Okay. So now we can use the Biot-Savar law to ma find the magnetic field produced by a straight current carrying conductor. Um, this is sort of a similar idea to what we just did, but now we're gonna now we're gonna do it from a little bit of a different perspective. So we're now we're gonna draw this figure out. So I want you to draw uh, the length of this. Draw this out on a piece of paper so you can visualize it, and then we're gonna go through and figure out what this will be useful for, for solving certain types of current and conductor problems. Okay. So we have our DL here. We have our origin. And then this is an x-axis here. And then we have some field point P here, and then 
our r vector points from some place along dl, dl associated with here. And then we have our r magnitude given by the Pythagorean, x squared plus y squared, just a magnitude of a vector. Um, and then we can say then that this is minus a and this is a. Then at point P, the field DB caused by each element of the conductor points into the plane of the page as it does for the total B field. So now we're saying that the infinitesimal bit of magnetic field points in this direction as well. So we can, we can the, the math goes nicely here. And then um, from the figure, you can see that sine of phi is equal to sine of pi minus phi. So that's equal to x over the magnitude of the vector. And then the right-hand rule for the vector product, dl cross r, shows the direction of db is into the plane of the figure, perpendicular to the plane. So you can also see now that all of the directions of the dbs from all the elements in the conductor are the same. Thus, integrating, we can just add all the magnitudes and get a significant simplification. So we couldn't necessarily do this for any arbitrary shape, okay? You don't have to think too hard about this, but just know that this law becomes simple because of this shape. If this was in a ring or something else, it could be very different, especially if it was an irregular shape. Okay. So now we can put all of these pieces together and we can actually get a really simple expression for the magnetic field due to a current carrying segment of wire. And we don't have enough time to go over trig substitution. That's like calc 2 or calc 3 depending upon your sequence. But we have a trigonometric integral which mathematicians love to do. And we'll just note that that's what we have. And you can solve this integral. You get the integral by integrating this expression and using it for this current carrying wire. And we have an x dy over the magnitude x squared plus y squared. And that's going to be squared. No, it's going to be to the 3 halves because it's square root, yeah, to the 3 halves times squared. Okay, so we have it to the 3 halves. That's what makes it the trig sub integral. And then when we do that, we're going to get a nice simplification. The B field due to this is mu naught i over 4 pi. And then we have this integral gives us 2a. So a is the, we like this because a is not a vector. a is just this length. So we have the length of the, the rod, so from negative a to a. So if this was from 0 to l, this integral would be different. So remember that. When you look at this integral, it's not enough to just memorize this completely. You have to look at the limits that they took when they did the integral and adjust it if it's not a it's going to be some other symbol but for this it's minus a to a so that evaluates to 2a and then we have on the bottom just the x over square root of x squared plus a squared which comes about from doing the trig, trig sub now when the length 2a of the conductor is much greater than its distance x from the point p, we can consider it to be infinitely long. So we have a further simplification. When a is much longer than x, the square root of x squared plus a squared is just approximately equal to a. Hence, in the limit that a goes to infinity, and this is, imp this is useful. A lot of wires, like if we're looking at the force for like, say like, communication towers or wires from power companies, we can essentially assume that they're infinite. And you'll have to actually use this in the field. 
when, when power companies set up power lines, they have to be concerned with these kinds of calculations because these B fields can be dangerous if they're not done properly. They can start fires and do different things. So this is an important formula. They actually use it in engineering. Maybe a little bit more sophisticated depending on the application, but the basic idea is there. We have a very nice, simple expression for an infinitely long wire. Mu naught I over 2 pi times a distance x. So when, to state one more time, when a is much larger than x, that's the thing. So we've got to be, we've got to, we could say we're standing here and we're looking at some power lines. Actually, they'd be up above most likely, but the idea is the same and you're, and you're, comparing what's the magnetic field due to these power lines or this this charge carrying uh, wire or, or conductor and then we can also find the direction of the magnetic field using the right hand rule from before we point our thumb in the direction of the current and that tells us the B field so it's going to wrap around and go like that for the person here for person here, it's going to be going directed this way. Depends on where, where you're standing. All right, let's do an example. We have a long straight conductor carries a one ampere current. At what distance from the axis of the conductor does the resulting magnetic field have magnitude five times ten to the minus four teslas? And that's about the Earth's magnetic field. Try to solve that now should be pretty easy. Okay, so the conductor is much greater than the distance to the field point, so we can use the ideas from before, and we have everything except for the target variable, the distance r. So we use our formula here. We rearrange things a little bit. So x goes over here, and b goes over here, and then we've just got this expression for r. So R is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi B. And you can plug in those values and you get the result that it's very close. It's only 4 millimeters away. So for some conductor that's infinitely long and carries a current of about 1 ampere, the distance to get the magnetic field is pretty small. It falls off pretty fast. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about the magnetic field of two wires. So we can have a situation where we have two wires going in, with both carrying currents, and they're going to exert magnetic forces on each other because they're both they're both wires, so they both have charges going in some direction. Q. So they have charges, and they're going in, if they're positive, we could say they're both going in this direction. Pay attention to the char charge sign whenever you're solving these problems. But we want to know what, what does these, so for two current carrying conductors, for two current carrying conductors, what is the magnetic force and magnetic field caused by these two wires? So we can see um, a cross-sectional view of two long, straight, parallel wires perpendicular to the x-y plane. 
So it's not the same view that I'm drawing here. It's a, it's a different view um, into and out of the page. But that's fine. That's kind of nicer to illustrate because we can see more of the magnetic field of interest if we do it in that angle. So I can redraw that in that angle too. Just know that these two can be roughly equivalent, except in this case, they'd be going in different directions. So we'll make this one going this way so that we're at least having some of them going in different directions. Okay, so we've got wire one. It's out of the page. It's carrying current I. And then we've got wire two. It's into the page. And then I can use my right hand rule to calculate um, the magnetic field components for different field points. So I've got this point I've got this point P1 we'll call it and how far is that away? It's going to be 3D away from this point so it's 3D away from that one and then it's another um, So actually, let's see here. Yeah, we have to, it's, it's very. So there's this, there's this sort of origin here that we call it here. This is P2. And P2 is 1D away from each of them. So 1D away from each of the wires. And then we've got this point P3, which is 2D away from P2. So it's another D away from from this point so it's another D away at point 3 and then point 1 is another 2D away from wire 1 so it's 2D away from wire 1 and 3D away from point 2 but you can see that in the in the picture here so now let's find the B field at points P1, P2, and P3. And then let's find an expression for the B field at any point on the X axis to the right of wire two. Okay, well we did it for one wire, but what about two? They're infinitely long, so we can use that formula. But how do we do it for two wires? Well, we have to use the principle of linear superposition. The principle of linear superposition says that if I have multiple sources of vector fields, the total vector field is just the vector sum of those. So we're going to actually calculate several magnetic fields, and we're going to add those together and do it that way. So let's try that now. Go ahead and get started with this problem, working through it. Think about using the formula that we ha just had. Um, I can put it back on the, it's this R, uh, you could use it in this form, or just B is mu naught I over two pi R. So B is mu naught I over two pi R. Okay, so just think about what R is in this case for this problem. We won't stay on this for too long because we have other stuff to cover. So there's a, another view of the B field. This, is, this you can see doing the right hand rule. So if I have the current going into, my, my field loops around this direction going like this into, out of, it's going the opposite and then we have the two fields meeting in the center, okay? So in order to find the expression, we use the principle of linear superposition. B total is B1 plus B2. And then what is B1? B1 is minus mu naught I over four pi D J hat. So B1, due to the first wire, B1 is minus mu naught I 
over 2 pi, and then it's d, because that's the distance away that we're looking at for the field point. So since P1 is a distance 2D from wire 1 and a distance 4D from wire 2, B1 is mu naught I over 2 pi ti times 2D is equal to mu naught I over 4 pi D. And B2 is mu naught I over 8 pi D. Both of them are in the J hat direction. and we replace that R with D, because that's the distance. And then we add those two together, and then we find that it's minus, because the first one is negative. It's minus mu naught I over eight pi D. So one of, those, one of those magnetic fields is negative, the other is positive. The negative field is stronger than the positive component, so the negative component takes over and halves but still becomes negative for the total at point one. And then at point two, a distance d from both of the wires, we use the same expression. And then b1 and b2 are both in the positive y direction. And they both and you can see that from the right hand rule. They both have the same magnitude. And so we just add those together and we get a nice uh, expression for the total magnetic field at point two. And then at point three, using the right-hand rule, we can see that B1 is in the positive y direction. B2 is in the negative y direction. And this point is a distance 3D from wire one and a distance D from wire two. So B1 contribution from that is mu naught I over two pi 3D. So a total of mu naught I over six pi D. And that's in the J hat direction. And B2 is in the negative J hat direction, mu naught I over 2 pi D J hat, for a total of minus mu naught I over 3 pi D in the J hat direction. So now we found the magnetic fields of all three points and their direction. Okay, we talked about finding the magnetic fields, but we know from before with our charge example that's, that that's not enough. We also have a force due to the magnetic fields. Just like in the last chapter, we not only have magnetic fields due to currents, due to charges, we also have forces on those charges. Same idea here. So now that we know how to calculate the magnetic field produced by a long current carrying conductor, we can find the magnetic force that one such conductor exerts on another. And I promise you, the result is gonna be a little counterintuitive to what you would expect. This force plays a role in many practical situations in which current carrying wires are close to each other. So we have this sort of situation where we have two long parallel conductors separated by a distance R. And the magnetic field of the lower wire exerts an attractive force on the upper wire. By the same token, the upper wire attracts the lower one. If the wires had currents in the opposite direction, they would repel each other. And so that's very counterintuitive because when we have like when we have opposite charges, right? When we have a positive and negative charge, they, they attract to each other. So you would think intuitively that if the currents are going in the same direction, they would repel, not attract. But that's not the case. And the result actually comes from length contraction and special relativity. You can show why this result happens from a physical standpoint because of how the relative velocities, because these currents have different relative velocities, there's, they're gonna experience some length contraction and they're actually seeing each other as, so this wire, even though these are both current carrying conductors from our perspective, from their perspective, because there's length contraction, it sees it, it's, say that the top wire is positive charges. Because of length contraction, it sees that the bottom wire is negative charged and gets attracted to it. But you can't see that with this law. We have to get into special relativity to show that. But just know that that's the actual uh, physical reasoning behind that. You can show that with special relativity. For this rule, it just comes about from the Biot-Savar law and applying the force for current carrying conductors. So here's an illustration of that. And if the currents are going in opposite directions, 
they repel from each other. So they're not always attractive. If I is in the opposite direction on one of them, then they're going to be repulsed. The force is not going to be attractive. But there you go. From the right-hand rule, you can see that this, that this is um, the case. Now, why do you, what part of the magnetic force, guess off the top of your head, what part of the magnetic force do you think makes it so that to see it correctly, you have to have relativity? What do we know about relativity? What's special about relativity that's different from other things? Reference frames. The frame of reference is relative. It doesn't matter. It should be, the laws of physics should be invariant. It shouldn't matter what reference frame. But with this magnetic force law, we have, we, we don't have invariance. We have to have a certain velocity. So who the observer is matters. And that's a problem for physics. And that means that in certain cases, this magnetic force law won't, won't obey Newton's laws because it's not invariant. And so this non-invariance of, of the magnetic force law is partly what led Einstein to this theory of special relativity. But just know for now that the velocity dependence of the magnetic force it means it's not an invariant force. None of the other forces that we think about have any velocity dependence. They just depend upon the position, like the electric force and the gravitational force. The magnetic force shouldn't depend on the velocity either. It shouldn't depend on the observer, and it doesn't when we write it in the special relativity form, but in this form it does. Anyway, that's the uh, reason that these sort of relativistic effects become important in explaining some of this phenomenon and behavior. Okay, so parallel conductors carrying currents in the same direction attract each other. The diagrams show how the magnetic field B caused by the current in the lower conductor exerts a force on the upper conductor. And from the equation we had before, the lower conductor produces a B field that at the position of the upper conductor has a magnitude of this. Okay, so now we can do our equation we had before where we had IL cross B. So force is the, um, you know, QV cross B, where the L is the direction of the current I. So that's your QV, right? QV, V is Q and V are built into that I, and it has a magnitude L. Since B is perpendicular to the length of the conductor, and hence to L, the magnitude of the force is just ILB, or mu naught I of one times the I of the other times L over 2 pi R. And then F is the force per unit length. Okay. Now let's do a problem. Really quick. This will be the last problem for the day. We have two straight parallel superconducting wires, 4.5 millimeter apart, and they carry equal currents of 15,000 amperes in opposite directions. What force per unit length does each wire exert on the other? Okay, they're moving in opposite directions, so are they going to be attractive or repulsive? Okay, great. I heard the R, repulsive. Okay, so solve this really quick. We've got about four minutes total. Oh yeah, there's one more thing while you're solving this. If anybody does not have access to the Mastering Physics homework, let me know. And then also, how many of you are getting only three attempts per problem? Because it should be a lot more. Okay, there's only a few people. I do not know why some people have the wrong number of attempts that I didn't specify for the software. How could it have so many like irrelevant problems coming up? All right, so just so you know, if you only get three attempts for the Mastering Physics homework, as long as you have it, you'll get full credit as long as you attempt the homework. If that's an issue, though, for you because you want to see the solution or have more attempts, let me know. I don't know why that problem exists for a few people, but I keep getting that email. As long as you have access to the Mastering Physics, though, all the homeworks, and there's only one homework right now. I'm going to assign more homework now that we've done this lecture. But um, anyway, just know that attempting the homeworks and doing the problems yourself will get you full credit because that's what I want. I don't want people copying solutions. I want people to try it, make mistakes, learn, and then you get the full credit for the process. And then you demonstrate that knowledge on the quiz. Also, the quiz is going to be next week. I, I posted the date and I've made an announcement. 
So if anybody has any questions about that, that's been posted as well. All right, let's go over the solution real quick. Okay, so we have a picture of this case, and we have the distance that they're separated from each other. So now we can do F per unit length, and we have that formula. So we have mu naught times the currents, I and I prime. That's just the, the notation for the two different currents. They're the same, so they multiply together. And then we've got over 2 pi r. So we get a really large force, actually. So if we have really large currents, we're going to have really strong forces going. And, and that's interesting because at CERN, in this place I talked about earlier, we have protons moving extremely, extremely fast. So it's a significant current, but it is only a few charges. So you, know, you have to weight that with the total... Uh, magnitude of the charge comes into play so there's not a lot of them but still there's a significant magnetic field generated and that has to be taken into account when they the directions are being oriented okay so that's um, all that I have for today I'll post these lecture slides I'm gonna have office hours right after this everybody have a great day